Okay, so we are starting something new this morning. Uh, we're doing an introduction to the book of Matthew, which I'm so excited for. We've been in that since the day I became a youth pastor to now. We're halfway through it, which has been like two years. So love Matthew. We feel like the youth are like, great, Matthew, more Matthew. Um, but if you want to open up to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, we're just going to read the very first verse together. And... Britt wanted me to let you guys know he's praying and considering, and he decided to stick with the NASB, his NASB, his just favorite translation, so that's what he's going to be. I actually I joke with him, that's like an old school Bible. I have an ESV, which is almost identical, so I'm reading out of the ESV. You probably, if you have a NASB, it won't notice any difference, um, but he decided to stick with that, so that's what we'll be in. So let's read the first verse together, and then let's pray. says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Lord, we, we thank you for this book. We thank you for the book of Matthew. We thank you for your word, God. Thank you that when we open this up, especially the book of Matthew, we, we are seeing the words of Jesus. This is the word of God. It's living. It's active. It's the sword that your spirit uses to cut away things that shouldn't be there, to convict us, to point us to Jesus, to show us our need for Jesus, to show us the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Lord, this is all about you, Jesus. And we're just excited together to, to spend who knows how long in a book just about you. So Holy Spirit, would you help us now? This, there's a lot of information and it's going to be new. God, would you help our minds? Would you help us to, um, to listen and to understand and to comprehend? God, even this morning, would you teach us new things about yourself in this book? We're just excited to meet with you and hear from you, God. Would you help me, Lord? Would you um, help all of us to hear from you this morning? It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in, in most stories, great, the great like written stories throughout all time, there's almost always this common theme in these stories, okay? It's this, it's this longing for a king, this longing for a hero or a rescuer who's going to lead a group of people out of a mess and bring them into like fullness of life, right? We see that in classic fairy tales. This knight comes, defeats the dragon, rescues the princess, marries her, ends in a marriage. That story is retold all the time. We see it in like a classic story of the legend of King Arthur, just this king, this deliverer. My personal favorite, Lord of the Rings, right? Like the return, there's this king, he's coming, he's going to make it right. He's this anointed king. We even see it in Star Wars. We see like the Jedi, like there, there's, some, there's someone that's going to come make it right. There's going to bring balance to the way things are meant to be. And then we see, we see it in negative examples in like dystopian stories, right? We see, we see what happens when you have bad kings or bad rulers or, or corrupt societies in like the Hunger Games or most of Shakespeare's dramas are like what happens with a bad king and what does that mean for society? And, and then we see this actually happen in history. Like the drama of kings and kingdoms in history is just, I mean, read just history, it reads like story, it reads like fairy tales, just these, these kings, this longing for a king to make it right. We even feel that now today, like the election. Who's going to make this right? Who's going to fix our country? Who's going to make this home the way that it's supposed to be? And, and I believe these stories ring so true. They just resonate with us because they're echoing the true story, like a true story, the way that we know things are meant to be deep down inside. We know there's supposed to be a king who's going to make it right, who's going to rescue us, who's going to deliver us from evil and bring us into this kingdom where things are meant to be. We know that. We have a longing for that. The true, I mean, that's the true story. That's the story of the word of God. I mean, from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, it's this longing of who's going to make this right? We messed it up. Who's going to make this right again? We see it in the Exodus, right? Who's going to deliver us and lead us into a home, the promised land? Like, yes, this is the way it's supposed to be. 
We see it in the book of Judges. It's the lack of a king, the lack of leadership, and just Israel is falling apart. The book of Judges is unbelievable, the stories in Judges, getting us ready for a king. We see, we see a, a glimpse of the king in David, right? His reign, it is good. He loved and feared the Lord. Yet even David wasn't perfect, and even David died. But God promised from the day of David on, there'd be another king. His kingdom would never end. We see it in the exile, right? The Israel sins and they rebels and they lose their kingdom and now they're under the reign of another uh, kingdom and, and they're longing like, who will get us back to Jerusalem? Who will get us back to the temple? Who will get us back to the way things are meant to be? And then it goes silent for 400 years. God doesn't speak through prophecy. There's silence. The Roman Empire comes and takes over the Jewish nation. They're living in the promised land under this pagan society and rule, and it's just silent. And then the king arrives in the book of Matthew. So excited for Matthew because Matthew is the story of the king bringing his kingdom. And what does it mean to be the the people, to be the belonging to the king as the people of the king under his rule. And we even see in Matthew the rejection of this king. When a good king comes, he mixes things up and there's a rejection of this king. And and so Matthew is going to be the next book for who knows how long. And so we're just going to go through a couple fun, interesting facts to kind of frame Matthew. We're going to talk about the structure of Matthew. And then we're going to really briefly kind of give you like a taste of the themes, the beauty, the scope of Matthew this morning. So Matthew, as you know, it's the first book in the New Testament. It actually, it's not the first written, that was Mark, but it, it, it's always been the first. When the church history was, the church uh, fathers were compiling, okay, what is this New Testament, this, the, the word of God? We see that God has spoken On every one of those lists, throughout all church history, when they're figuring that out, Matthew was always first. It wasn't written first, but Matthew was always first. Why was that? Why is Matthew the first book of the New Testament? Number one, it's it's the most natural bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Matthew is very interested in showing us that this, this isn't like a new story. This isn't some new thing. Jesus didn't show up on the scene and change things around. He wants wants us to see Jesus is fulfilling the promises of the entire story. In Matthew, there's over 60 references in the book of Matthew to the Old Testament. Prophecies are showing us how Jesus completes the Old Testament. Number two, it was just an early favorite in church history. Matthew uh, is the most thorough, um, what's the word? like recollection of the teachings of Jesus, you get the most thorough, organized, systematic teachings of Jesus in Matthew. That was actually Matthew's focus. More than any of the other four gospels, Matthew wanted us to see what Jesus taught us about himself. The structure of Matthew. What's the structure of Matthew? I'm going to give you kind of two ways to look at the book of Matthew. The first way is is kind of what me and Britt put together, and this is what we're going to follow throughout the whole book. So the first two chapters are about the birth of the king. We hear the story of Jesus being born, and we even see about like the, uh, the genealogies and, and leading up to his birth. Next, we see the preparation of the king. He gets baptized. He's uh, in, the, in the wilderness getting tempted. Then we see the king's call, where God like anoints him, and this is my son. After that, we see the qualities of the kingdom, Okay, the word, side note, kingdom is used a lot in Matthew. The reason why is because there's a king. The kingdom is, is what belongs to the king, the way the king rules. Who, what, is, what is the kingdom? It's, it's where the king is ruling and reigning. And, and in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, we see a picture of what it looks like to be in the kingdom. After that, we see the king's power demonstrated. He extends his power. Any great king always extends their power, like flexes their muscles. This is who I am. After that, we see opposition to the king. Pharisees, and and they begin to like actively reject Jesus. Then we see the parables of the kingdom. That whole chapter, just parables about what the kingdom looks like. 
After that, we see more signs of the king, healing and miracles, Jesus showing his authority, just feeding thousands, that kind of thing. After that, we see the king in Jerusalem, and this is Jesus getting ready to be crucified. He, he's heading there. He knows what's happening, and we see him in Jerusalem. Then in uh, 24 and 25, we see the return of the king foretold. Jesus knows it's towards the end of his life, and he wants us and his disciples to know what's happening, what we're, what we're looking forward to, what the end of, of time looks like, the fact that he's coming again. And then 26 through 28 is the king's cross, resurrection, and commission. It's kind of like the grand scope of the storyline, if you will. Um, but Matthew was strategic in how he compiled his, uh, his gospel because he actually blends multiple sermons of Jesus, multiple teachings, and he kind of compiles them all into this nice chunk of a sermon. We see in other books like Mark and in Luke, oh, it's like, oh, Jesus said that then, but then it looks like he said it a different time over here, and why is that? It seems different. The reason is because Matthew wanted to collect all of Jesus' teachings into these cohesive sermons, and he structures his entire book around five sermons of Jesus. So you get all the teachings of Jesus in five sermons in Matthew. They're not like interspersed throughout. It's like you get a story and then a sermon. And so the, the other way to look at Matthew is to look at it with the five discourses or sermons structure. So typically it starts with some story and then he gives a sermon. So it goes the beginning of the story, the birth of Jesus, Matthew's telling us what's leading up to that, and then sermon number one, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And he gives us some more story about Jesus, and then we give this, he gives us this sermon on mission. He sends out his disciples. He tells them what it means to be on mission, what you're going to experience on mission. People are going to reject you, and, and it, it's a great preparation for us on mission. What does it mean to be on mission? He gives us more story, and then sermon number three, which is all about the kingdom of heaven, just in parables in, the, in parables in chapter 13, you get some more story. And then sermon number four, which is all about the church. It's the first time we see the word church in the New Testament. Jesus is saying, I'm building my church. This is what it means to be in my church. This is um, how you are to discipline and structure the church. This is how you're to handle someone who sins against you in the church. Then we get a, a more story. And then his final sermon, which is what to expect in the future. And then ends with the death, resurrection, and the commission of Jesus. So that's big picture, how to think about Matthew as a whole. But here's, here's kind of a question for us. Why Matthew and, and why now, right? Like, like why as a church, this is an investment, we'll be in it for a while. Why? What's the heart behind why we want to be in this book right now? And the first reason, it's the best reason, it's about Jesus, Right? This church is about Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus. Everything we do is for the glory and the name of Jesus. And what better way than to spend a couple years in a gospel all about Jesus? The whole Bible's about Jesus. Jesus tells us that, but it's so refreshing to just read a gospel where it's so clearly, easily Jesus. We just get to sit at the feet of Jesus. We get to see what he was like, how he loved people, how he was. So the first thing we're excited about, it's just, it's Jesus. The second is the king's people. And, and just so you know, there's four reasons why in Matthew, and these are the themes of Matthew, okay? So the first theme, Jesus, obviously, the king. The second is the king's people. Another way you could uh, phrase that are disciples. And, and here's Brit, when he chose this, this is big on his heart, is Jesus helps us understand what it means to, to actually follow him in this book. In the book of Matthew in particular, we see the picture of a disciple. And, and far too often in the church, we, we emphasize good things and don't emphasize other good things. So we're not saying these are bad things, but we can often emphasize, hey, you need to get saved. We should emphasize that. Eternity is a long time. Heaven's really important. But then we tend to not emphasize, so what does that mean? And, and what does it mean to be a disciple? So did Jesus just go around like, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved, see you later, go to heaven, and disciples do the same? No, he actually said, come follow me. Come be a disciple of me. And, and actually, we see this pretty crazy picture as we get into it of 
Leave everything behind and follow me. Leave your family and follow me. Leave your jobs and follow me. You can't serve me and money. You have to pick me above everything else. This radical picture of discipleship. Yes, we have to get saved. But when you're saved, Jesus makes you into a type of person called a disciple. And every one of us are disciples. If you are a Christian, that is your identity. And so what does it look like to be a disciple? That is a huge theme in all of the teachings in Matthew in particular. What does it look like to be on mission, to follow Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus? And that's something we're really excited about. This is going to help us understand more as Jesus teaches, what does it mean to actually follow him? What does it mean to follow him? Because the danger is this. Yeah, 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 I'm a Christian. Like polls in America, like supposedly three out of every four people are Christians, right? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Of course, I believe I got saved. I went to camp. I did that as a kid. I'm a Christian. But the picture in Matthew is to be a Christian is to be a disciple. And, and there's a very specific, even radical uh, way that, that, that means to follow Jesus. You're called to follow him. You're called to be like him. So that's a huge theme in the book of Matthew. The third theme is his kingdom. Naturally, what does it mean and look like when Jesus, the king, is ruling and reigning? What, what would the world be if Jesus were, were king? And Jesus gives us a taste of that in Matthew, right? We, there's, a, there's a way to think of the kingdom of God in two ways. It's already here. It came when Jesus came. It's inaugurated with the king, but it's not fully here. And we get that. We look around. We see, okay, I believe Jesus is ruling and reigning, but but the world's not as it should be. And so Jesus comes and he gives us just a glimpse, a taste. This is what it looks like to follow me. This is what it looks like to have a society and a people truly following me. Like no more sickness. Jesus is forgiving people of their sins. The rejected, the outcast are being brought in. The poor are getting loved. So we get a picture naturally of his kingdom. And we get a picture of what will be when Jesus comes again, right? Like we get a little glimpse of what we have to look forward to. And then the fourth theme, it's a tragic theme in Matthew, is the rejection of the king. Matthew is very clear all throughout to show us, look at these people who are rejecting the king. Look at what it looks like. Look what kind of person rejects the king. Look what kind of person is really drawn to the king. Look, look at, and look at what the end result of rejecting the king is. And we see the cross. We see the Pharisees. We see the Romans. We see the Jews rejecting Jesus. But that's not just at the, at the cross. It's, it's start to finish. We see this pushback against the king. And so here's how we're going to spend most of our time this morning. And have your Bibles ready. We're just going to marinate and walk through almost every chapter of the book and just get some nuggets on those themes. And, and more than anything else, I just want you to just, yes, like wash yourself. Listen to the word of God. Listen to the words of Jesus. Listen to the, what it means that Jesus is here, that his kingdom is here. What does it mean to follow him? What does it mean and, and what does rejection of the king look like? And so, um, you guys ready? This is going to be 28 chapters. So you guys ready? Here we go. Chapters one through three. So right off the bat, we're getting three chapters out. Chapters one through three are all about the king, exclusively who is this king. We started with the first verse of the book, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, the son of Abraham. So this is the story of Jesus Christ. But Matthew quickly shows us, hey, guess who? He's the son of David, and he's the son of Abraham. Arguably the two most important people in the Old Testament, Matthew wants us to see, look at Jesus. He's connected to them. He's fulfilling their calling of David. He's fulfilling the promises to Abraham. <clears throat> and you know, if you've ever read the Bible just straight through, um, there comes a point where you're very weary of like the Israelites, you're like, oh my gosh, when does Jesus come? And it just keeps going and going and going. You're like, when can I just get to Matthew, right? And you're so excited. But then, but then once you read Matthew, you can't really read the Old Testament the same way again. 
you see that Jesus doesn't just fulfill the story of David and fulfill the story of Abraham. You see that, that the story of, Dabra, of David and the story of Abraham are actually about Jesus all along. You see that from the beginning, God knew what he was doing. He made a king so that we could get ready for the king of kings. And he, he made a promise to Abraham about, I'm going to bless you to bless the nations because he knew he was bringing Jesus through whom all the nations would be blessed. So it's so helpful when we read Matthew, you get to like read the Old Testament with this Jesus-centered lens. Jesus fulfills and is what actually this has all been about all along. Next verse about the king. In 123, it says, Behold, and this is a prophecy, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Oh, that's such a good word. That word is God with us. We see from chapter one, Jesus is God. And, and God left heaven and came to be with us. Like that is unbelievable. That's who Jesus is. Chapter two, verse two, we see more of the king. The, uh, the magi come to see baby Jesus and they say, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So here's what we get. Jesus isn't just a king. He's a king who deserves to be worshiped. How about that? Now, kings throughout history think they deserve to be worshiped, but Jesus is the true king who doesn't just des like, deserve your allegiance per se. He deserves your worship. King Jesus deserves worship. And then finally, chapter 3, this amazing picture of Jesus, 317, it says, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. He's the Son of God. And do you know what's so beautiful about that verse? This is before Jesus accomplished anything in ministry. This is before Jesus went and healed anyone, did any miracle, died on the cross. From the beginning, Jesus is a son of God. And, and, and that is significant for us. Did you know God loves us not because we can do something for him, but because we're his sons and his daughters? Like, we're his sons and his daughters. What he says of Christ, if, if you have come to Christ, you are a son, you are a daughter of God. Before you do anything, God says of you, this is my beloved son, my beloved daughter. I am well pleased with them. Love that about Jesus. Then we move on, chapters from chapters one to three. Chapter four is about the king, and it, but it's also about the king's people. In, in uh, verse one, we read, then Jesus was held up by the spirit into, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We see this picture of, of Jesus resisting what no one in history had been able to resist. This is redeeming the Garden of Eden. This is redeeming Israel in the wilderness after they've been delivered out of Egypt. Jesus is doing what no one has been able to do yet, and he resists Satan. He resists temptation, and he does that on our behalf. And then in verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus says this, he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. So that verse, that's the first uh, account of the calling of a disciple in the Bible right there. That's the first picture of what, it, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? And honestly, it's pretty gnarly. They literally left their nets on the ground their livelihood, and follow Jesus. The next, right after that, James and John, they leave their father and follow him. They leave their jobs, they leave their families. And then in chapter eight, skipping ahead, Jesus says to one, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. This man's like, God, can I just go bury my father? Jesus is like, he's already dead. You need to follow me. That's a radical picture of discipleship. Chapters five through seven the Sermon on the Mount. There, it's about the kingdom and the king's people. It starts off with this verse, in verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And Jesus starts the most famous sermon with these words. And this is why these words are significant. Jesus says, yeah, follow me. But to follow me, do you know what it requires of you? You need to be poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? You need to realize that you are spiritually bankrupt. You have nothing to offer God. You, you have to be poor in spirit. You have to come to Jesus as a sinner, recognizing I need you. I don't have anything to offer you. I need you. I am poor in spirit. And that's how Jesus starts his sermon. This kingdom is not for the strong. This kingdom's for the weak. And then in verse 20, this verse pretty much sums up the Sermon on the Mount. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a heavy statement there. Later on, he says, uh, by the way, you have to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus demands of his people true righteousness. True righteousness. What does that mean? More than the Pharisees. What was the, the righteousness of the Pharisees? The Pharisees were great at external, look at me, look what I'm doing, look how I'm righteous, look at me. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, it's not external, it's internal. And then he just like blows us out of the water. He's like, you've heard it said, don't be mad at people. But I tell you, if you've even been angry, you're guilty of murder. He says, you, you've, you've heard don't murder. We're all like, great, I got that down. I haven't murdered anyone. And Jesus is like, actually, you have in your heart. Like, oh. He says, yeah, you've heard don't commit adultery. The Pharisees like, got it, nailed it, never committed adultery. Jesus is like, actually, you have. If you've even lustfully looked at someone, you're guilty of adultery. Like, oh. Jesus says, yeah, you've heard it said, uh, keep your word. But he says, I don't even want you to make a promise. I don't even want you to say an oath. I just want your yes to be yes. Jesus says, you've heard, don't retaliate. You've heard, uh, like, an eye for an eye. But I tell you, don't even get, don't even return the blow for blow. I just want you to turn your other cheek. Jesus says, yeah, yes, we need to love people, but I want you to love your enemies. Jesus says, when you give to the needy, because you should, and when you pray and when you fast, he says those things assuming when you do these things, nobody should know. You should not do, do these things for external show. Look at me, I'm fasting. Look at me, I'm praying. Look at all this money I've given to the poor. He says, don't even let your right hand know what your left is doing. No one should even know about your righteousness. And then he says, when it comes to judging others, don't do it. I want you to be merciful. Jesus teaches us and gives us this picture of what a disciple looks like. A disciple is someone whose righteousness comes from the inside out. You can't do any amount of external things to become righteous for God. You have to be changed from the inside out, true righteousness. And then this is also, this sermon is a picture of the kingdom of God. It, it would be like uh, if you were to enter this kingdom and at the gates is like, this, this is what, these are the rules here. These are the laws here. Like imagine a society in which there was no anger, no lust or divorce no broken promises, just grace and love for everyone always, no poor, no needy, no religious performance. Like imagine that society. That is the kingdom of God. Move on to chapters eight and nine. The themes here are, are all three, the king, the kingdom, and his people. And we're gonna move quickly through this one. Basically, here's what happened. Jesus heals people of leprosy. He heals a paralyzed servant. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He calms a storm. He heals two men of demons. He heals another paralytic. He raises a dead girl from dead to life. He heals two blind men. He heals a mute. And he caps it all off after all the healing in chapter 9, verse 2. And he tells a paralytic, by the way, your sins are forgiven. Okay, he just like undid Everything bad. He's undoing the curse. He's undoing the effects of sin in the world. No more death, no more disease, no more sickness. And by the way, no more sins. Like Jesus is flexing his might. This is who I am. Look at my authority over the world. I am in charge. This is also, again, a picture of the kingdom. The kingdom one day, no more sins, no more suffering, no more sickness. That is what we're looking forward to. And then the third thing, the king's people, do you know what's radical about the majority of the people Jesus healed? Uh, 
a leper, which can't even be in human society, a Roman soldier who has the greatest faith Jesus had ever witnessed, demon-possessed Gentiles, uh, outcast, oppressed, and sinners. Like, Jesus just demonstrated who he is to the absolute rejects of society. Absolute rejects. And then almost as a footnote in chapter 9, Matthew writes of himself. And he's like, this is when Jesus called me. In the, this lump of rejects and sinners, that's when he called me. I was at my tax booth, corrupt, be, betraying my Jewish people, working for the Roman government, taking skimming off the top, making money off it, hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And then Jesus came to me and he said, Matthew, you come follow me. And then that night, Jesus went to Matthew's house and was eating with the tax collectors and sinners. Matthew wants us to know this is the kind of person that is attracted to Jesus. Those who know I need him. I need him. And, and here's good news for us. Do you ever feel disqualified from Jesus? Like, like haven't we all felt like, oh, my sin? Have when we all come to church on Sunday just feeling like ashamed and just Satan is just running our sins through our mind? Just who am I? How could I ever come to Jesus? And chapters eight and nine of Matthew is, hey, you're exactly who should come to Jesus. Jesus came for sinners like you, sinners like me. In fact, if you're righteous, by the way, you have no need for Jesus. He says that. I didn't come for righteous people. I came for sinners. I came for those who know they need him, who are poor in spirit. Chapter 10, more on the king's people. This is when Jesus calls the 12 disciples. The verse there, 10 verse 1, he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority. And then he sends them out on this mission trip and he teaches them what you're going to experience on mission and what it means to follow him. He tells them, hey, you're going to be rejected. You're going to be persecuted, but it's worth it. That's basically what he does in chapter 10. Chapter 11, we get more of Jesus and his kingdom. And uh, we come upon maybe personally the favorite, most beautiful words I personally think Jesus has ever spoken in chapter 11. He says at the end of chapter 11, listen to this, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, on a personal note, I used to, I used to actually, I probably would say hated the book of Matthew. I knew I was supposed to read it. I knew it was in the Bible. But every time I read it, I just, I felt weight. I felt condemned. I read the Sermon on the Mount and I'm like, I'm guilty of all of these. Like, I hate reading this book. I, I felt weight. And then Jesus like, follow me, leave your family, sell your possessions. And I'm like, I haven't done any of those things. Like, it was just weight. And I would just think when I thought of the book of Matthew, Jesus saying, hey, you need to try harder. Hey, you need to do better. Hey, you need to get your act together. You want to be a disciple? It's time to get to work. And this was just this weighty, miserable book for me that I would do out of duty. Yet we see from this text that Jesus doesn't add burdens. He takes burdens off. The burden of sin the burden of religious performance, the burden of do more and then maybe God will love you. Do more and then maybe God will forgive you. Uh, there's this book, maybe we've probably all heard of it, called Pilgrim's Progress, Church History. He's a Puritan, like 1600s or something. And the main character is called Christian, right? It's, it's like blatant allegory. Like, I wonder what that means. And it's like, it's, the whole book is like that, and that's, that's like how he's teaching us. And so it's this story, and the, the author, he writes it as if it was this dream he had. Okay, and, and listen to this paragraph from the Pilgrim's Progress. It says this, Now I saw in my dream that the highway up which Christian was to go was fenced on either side with a wall, and that wall was called Salvation. Up this way, therefore, did burdened Christian run, 
but not without great difficulty because of the load on his back. He ran thus till he came to a place somewhat ascending, and upon that place stood a cross, and a little below in the bottom a tomb. So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up to the cross, his burden loosed from off his shoulders, fell from his back, and began to tumble, and continued to do so till it came to the mouth of the tomb where it fell in, and I saw it no more. Then was Christian glad and lightsome and said with a merry heart, he hath given me rest by his sorrow and life by his death. Then he stood a while to look and wonder, for it was very surprising to him that the sight of the cross should thus ease him from his burden. Jesus says, come to me, I'll take your burden of sin. Because he knows, do we not all know the burden of our sin, the weight, the chains. He says, come to me for some of you like me who are like a Pharisee and I just want to prove myself and I want to be better than others. He says, that's a burden. I know it's a burden. Stop it. Stop trying to earn my love. Stop trying to earn your salvation. You cannot do so. Only the cross and the tomb are where you're going to find rest for your souls. And so Jesus says, in the presence of Pharisees, come to me and you will finally find rest for your soul. You guys, following Jesus, it's, it's not religion. It's not work for God and then you're accepted by God. And all throughout this book, we see Pharisees come to Jesus with this question. Jesus, what must I do to be saved? What do I have to do? I'm pretty good at this. What else do I got to do? And do you know what Jesus actually does to them? He crushes them. And this is what he says. He's like, okay. Uh, he says, the rich young ruler, I see that you're good at following everything, but you're rich. And Jesus knows. He knows he won't give up his money. He says, why don't you sell your stuff and follow me? And that burden, that weight, it's, it's too much. The Bible says if you're guilty of even one sin, you're guilty of it all. But the Pharisees think, I can do this. I can muster up my strength. I can get the approval of God. Jesus, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? And here Jesus says, do you know what you really need to do? You need to come to me. Let me take your burden and I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy. Come to me. And then because of that, in chapter 12, we see this rejection of Jesus. He, like he's, he's throwing things out of whack. He's throwing this religious system, these Pharisees who had power and control and, and placed burdens on people. They begin to be like, wait, this, this is not good. This is not right. He's, he's freeing people from the burdens we're putting on them, and they begin to reject him. And look at chapter 12, verse 14. It says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. And, and this is like when Matthew begins to recall just blatant rejection and, and the plot to murder Jesus. Jesus, we see in chapter 12, he's condemned for his disciples like on a Sunday stroll, like picking grain. Like, you can't do that. Jesus then goes into the temple and there's a guy with a withered hand and Jesus heals it on the Sabbath. You can't do that. And by the way, Jesus isn't breaking biblical rules here. Those rules, you can't pick grain, you can't walk, you can't heal people, those aren't in the Bible. The Pharisees create extra rules, extra burdens, extra regulations so that they could know, yes, I'm following the rules. And Jesus is saying, those are man's rules and you're missing the point. You're missing what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath is rest and I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I am Lord of rest. And so from this moment, the, the Pharisees just begin to be like, man, we do not like this guy. They even condemn him of healing by the power of Satan. Like that's how twisted they begin to see. When, when Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, they're like, that's Satan. I don't know what that is, sorry. Chapter 13 is, uh, that's where we are with the youth right now. It's fun. All parables on the kingdom of God. And there's one verse in this chapter that in my opinion, sums up the entire, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? I love it. Favorite parable. In chapter 13, verse 44, this is what Jesus says. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure 
hidden in a field, (coughs) which a man found and covered up. Then in his misery and religious performance, no, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Okay, first thing we see there is the the incomparable worth of Jesus and his kingdom, right? It's like a treasure hidden in a field that's worth more than anything this man could possess. We see the worth of Jesus, the worth of his kingdom. And then we see what discipleship really is, right? To gain, for that man, to gain that treasure rightfully, what did he have to do? He had to sell his stuff and buy the field, right? He had to sell it. But here's the question. Was this self-sacrifice and selling everything, was it really a loss for this man? Like, no. Imagine this. Here's modern version. Uh, let's say that a week ago, I, someone, I don't know, someone could guarantee you 100% security, you will win the Powerball lottery, $1.5 billion. Here are the numbers. It's rigged. Here is what they're going to be. Here's the ticket. You can win, okay? But what you have to do for this $1.5 billion is you have to sell everything you own to buy this ticket, okay? Uh, would you do it? You would literally be insane to not do it. Are you losing because oh, I got to sell my house and that's my favorite car and oh, like I'm selling all my stuff. Let's say, you, let's say that was $10 million of worth of stuff. Just $10 million, $1.5 billion is more than that, right? We are never truly losing when we leave something for Jesus. You are never truly losing when you leave something for Christ. Like, like you're not actually sacrificing. Like, like, oh, woe is me. I'm like, no, you just, you're gaining. You're gaining Jesus. You're gaining the source of your joy forever. Like, honestly, I mean, look, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. Like, there is, there is not a place for Christian disciples to just, oh, I'm sacrificing for Jesus. Like, if you are sacrificing for Jesus, then, then you don't get Jesus because you're gaining when you sacrifice for Jesus. You are always and only gaining. When you obey Jesus, you're gaining. When you lose a possession for Jesus, you're gaining. You can never come to Jesus and lose. He is a treasure worth infinitely more than anything, than any sin, than any disobedience, than any earthly possession. This is discipleship. Yes, follow me. Yes, obey me. Yes, make disciples. But, but you're, you're disciples of me. You're gaining me for all of eternity. You would be crazy to not do that. And, and this is what Jesus means when he says three chapters later in 16, 25, and 26, for whoever would save his life will actually lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? To come to Jesus is to gain life, to find life for eternity. To the world, it may look like sacrifice. To the world, it may be like, why would you not do that? Why would you not cut corners there? Why would you not? And it may not make sense, but we know in our joy, we're gaining Jesus and we're gaining life. And just to hammer this home, because it's so amazing, um, one week ago was the 60-year anniversary of the death of Jim Elliott, which some of you know the story. I think it's, there's a movie too, the like, end of the spear or something. And it's five missionaries, South America, trying to reach this uh, unreached people group. Never heard of Jesus. Literally tribal spears. And so they're flying their plane. And 60 years ago, these five men, they had wives and children waiting for them. They fly in, they find this riverbed, they land, they're interacting and something goes wrong and all five of them get speared to death. Jim Elliott was one of them. And before Jim Elliott died, before he died, this is what he said. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. 
you get that? He is no fool who gives what he can't even keep to gain what he cannot lose. You guys, when we give obedience or time or resources or worship to Jesus, we are always receiving. In chapters 14 and 15, it's more about the king. Really quick, this is just miracles galore. Feeding 5,000, feeding 4,000, walking on water, healing more sick. Chapter 16, it's about the king and the king's people. This is when um, it, Matthew begins to kind of like polarize. The disciples start to kind of get it, and then the Pharisees start to like really reject Jesus. And it's in this chapter that Jesus asked Peter in verse 15, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is when God begins to show them this is who you're following. You're following the Messiah, the Son of God. And then right after that, this promise about the church, Jesus says, we love this, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's kind of the first glimpse of the church in, in the Bible right there. Chapter 17 is more on the king. This is the transfiguration. Jesus begins to head towards Jerusalem. He's telling them, I'm going to die. But then they begin to see more of like, wait, this is, this is like God. And so Jesus goes up on a mountain and, and look at verse 1 and 2. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. The main thing there is like, that's Jesus in a little glimpse of his glory. They just got a picture of like, okay, you're probably, Jesus knows I'm going to die and you're probably going to die following me, but I want you to get a picture of who it is you're serving. Like, boom, on a mountain, Peter's just like undone. Chapters 18 through 20 is more teaching uh, for the king's people. This is teaching on the life in the church. This is teaching on humility, right? Like serve one another. Who's the greatest? It's, the, it's actually the one who is the least. I want you to forgive one another. He talks more about divorce and marriage there. He tightens the reins on divorce. He talks about church discipline there. If a brother sins against you, this is what I want you to do. And, and a verse that just sums up these three chapters is verse 20, verse 26 to 28. Jesus says, it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So good. Jesus was God, just transfigured on a mountain. And then he's like, and I came to serve you. How can I serve you? That's our king. And he says, and I want you to do the same. And then we just get that glimpse right there at the end of, of the cross. I'm, I came to give my life. Do you know the way I'm going to serve you best? I'm going to give my life as a ransom for your sin. In chapters 21 to 23, more on the king and rejection of the king. This is Jesus coming into Jerusalem, right? Entering, this is the final week of his life by chapters 21 and 21 verse 5. This is, this is an awesome prophecy Jesus fulfills. It says, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. Your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. It's just mind-blowing God. It's like, I'm going to ride in on a donkey. Um, he goes into the temple. He sees corruption there. He clears that out. And uh, right after he clears the temple, this is, this is pretty crazy. Look at this verse. Um, 21, 14, and 15, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. I mean, just clears the temple, and then the blind and the lame come to him, and he heals them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to son of David, they were indignant. Jesus is overthrowing their religious system. And then this is also when Jesus he sees the rejection. He gives these like woes to the Pharisees. People even say it's like the anti-type of the Beatitudes. He's like, you guys are the opposite of the Beatitudes. <clears throat> and he mourns and laments over his people. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. We even see Jesus' tenderness there towards those who killed all his prophets and who are about to kill him. Then Jesus gives us one last teaching segment in 24 and 25. Um, He talks about when he comes back and you get parables on the second coming and you get what it's going to be like when God comes and separates us all. And this verse sums it up well, 24, uh, 30 through 31. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So Jesus is coming back. He's coming for us. And he he asks, are you going to be ready? How will you be found? Will you be found faithful? Will you be found to be my disciple? Or will you be like these sleeping servants or the 10 virgins or the five who didn't have their oil? And he gives all these stories. Are you ready for me to come back? And then 26 and, and the rest of the book now is, is this up close, zoomed in, like Jesus is about to die. And this is Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples. And we read this. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. And that, they don't even know what he's saying. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it. All of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's amazing. And I imagine the disciples just like sipping like, what is he saying? His blood, we're drinking his blood, I don't know. And, and Jesus knows he's about to go to the cross. And this is the picture of the new covenant. This is the fulfillment of the old covenant. Jeremiah prophesied about this covenant saying, hey, there's going to come a day when I'm actually going to change my people's hearts and they're going to obey me from their heart. And this is the fulfillment of that Jesus is talking about. And then in chapter 27, we see the ultimate rejection of the king. And just two uh, separate passages here to get the, the weight of this. In 28, it says, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, hail king of the Jews. And this, this is a real king. This is, this is the king. And they're mocking him. And then verse 50 And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. We see right there, that's the end. That's the end of the old system. That's the end of coming to Jesus with your own sacrifices. That's the end of the priests. That's the end. Jesus now is the sacrificial lamb. Jesus now is the high priest. Jesus is now the mediator, not a curtain in a temple, between God and man. And then chapter 28, so good. We're going to read the first seven verses here. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, sorry, I'm going to spoil the book of Matthew for you guys. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you shall see him. See, I have told you. And then they see Jesus and he spends his last few weeks with his disciples. And then these are the last words of the book of Matthew, the last words of Jesus to his disciples, to us now. If we're his disciples, this is Jesus charged to your life. It says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He is the king. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
And that, that's the book of Matthew. And, and that promise, the king, the king who came in chapter one as a baby, Emmanuel, he is still with us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. You are indwelling the presence of Jesus through his spirit right now. He is your king. You are called to follow him, to, to put him before anything and everything else and to actually gain when you do so. And because he is our king, because he's worthy like the magi, not just of our allegiance, not just of our obedience, he's worthy of our worship. Amen? And so right now, we're going to have an opportunity to worship the king of kings. We have an opportunity to fall before him, to give him praise. There's a story here of the woman just pouring out ointment. It's just embarrassing in front of people like Pharisees. What is this woman doing? And that's just this picture of, I don't care what people think. This is King Jesus. He is worthy of my worship. And right now, let's, let's worship him. Let's raise our hands to him. Let's exalt him. Let's fall on our face. Let's take communion and remember what he's done. That that is his body that he broke for our sins. That's the blood he poured out to cleanse us of our sins. Will you follow him? Will you worship him right now? Let's pray. Jesus, we declare that you are King Jesus. You are the Son of God. You are worthy of allegiance. You are worthy of obedience. You are worthy of our very lives, God, and you are worthy of our worship right now. Lord, would you help us, God? Would you would your spirit wake us up? Would your spirit help us to see more clearly who this is? That who is this king? Help us to see more clearly the worth of you, King Jesus, that we would worship you, that we would sing to you, that we would pour out our heart and our affections onto your feet. For truly no one can compare, Christ. No one can compare to you. God, I pray for those like myself when we wake up and we look at our Bibles and, and we think about going to church and we know it's right, but man, our hearts are cold. Jesus, would you help? Would you help us? Would, would we just simply come to you? God, if that's us right now, if we have doubts, if, if we have guilt, if, if we have a, a Pharisee heart, Lord, would we simply just come to you right now? Would we come, would we know that right now we get to receive from you? We get to receive forgiveness of sins. We get to receive rest for our souls. We get to receive the presence with which King David said is better than anything else in the world, better than when grain and wine abound. It's joy to the full. Jesus, would you help us right now experience that joy in your presence? God, may we not come burdened. May we come to your cross and just feel the weight lifted. We are sons and daughters of the King. He loves us. He's forgiven us. And would from that place, would we worship you now?